stories don't define you, how you tell them will. Hi, I'm Sarah Elkins, your host and chief storymaker of Elkins Consulting. Many of my clients reach out to me because they're in transition. Their children are hitting milestone ages. They want more from their work. They're hitting a big number birthday, and they want to develop clarity about their natural strengths, what their next adventure might look like. In this series, you'll hear me ask my guests questions to dig deeply into the stories that shaped their lives, stories that uncover patterns and may unveil insights into dissatisfaction and also where their strengths lie and where they found and continue to find joy. This podcast's intention is to have listeners think of their own related stories and how they tell them, discovering the internal messages that are limiting their success and discovering how to shift their stories so they become positive life lessons to move them forward. If you're curious about what it would be like to work with me, visit elkinsconsulting.com and schedule a one-time 90-minute StrengthsFinder session. Yet another phenomenal introduction from one of my friends. I've, I've been so fortunate to have introductions from Laura Di Benedetto and a woman named Meg Nossero. Today is Laura's friend that she introduced me to, Trey Kaufman. And um, I, I can't explain what the connection was when we met the first time, but as the listeners start hearing our banter and the way that we talk to each other, they'll understand the connection probably better than I do. So Trey, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. Um, You are calling in from Columbus, Ohio. Yes, and it's starting to pour down rain. So hopefully it doesn't start thundering, but yeah, uh, Columbus, Ohio, uh, right here in the Midwest. Uh, Well, coming from the West West, we would appreciate some of that rain over here, if you wouldn't mind. (laughs) Sure, I will. I I think it usually comes from your your, your end of the country, but I will try and send it your way. Yeah, that'd be great. (laughs) Yes. It's been really smoky. I just spent last weekend in Park City, Utah, and it was so smoky, I couldn't even hike. It was so sad. That's terrible. It is. It is. So um, I usually start these conversations by asking my guests to share something about themselves that most people don't know about them, something that's not on their bio or resume or LinkedIn profile. Do you have something in off the top of your head that you could share with us? I think, th- th- I don't know if this is what you're asking or not, but the first thing that comes to my head, something that I have not, I've given my I try not to brag about or I don't want to brag about because I, I, I feel like it comes off as weird, but I've really developed this strange relationship with food lately where I have gotten a better understanding of what it is that I want to put into my body. And so now food has become this, I only, I only, it's a, it's a, it's a fuel source for me. And I, I know there's so many traditions and, 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 uh, types of feelings around food and why we eat. But to me, it's just become this, it's a necessity and nothing else. And so I'm, I'm really trying to understand my new relationship with that because it's not something that I'm super comfortable talking about, but for whatever reason, that's the first thing that popped into my head. Well, that is something I definitely would not have known about you. Yeah. So, wow. Uh, When did this start? I, I, it, it started, I've always been a very healthy eater, at least for the most part. I, I quit eating sugar many years ago. Um, I, I quit drinking alcohol about two years ago. And so health and wellness have always been a very strong pursuit of mine. And so toward right in the middle of the pandemic, I decided that I, I mean, obviously restaurants weren't open and I started to cook all of my meals for myself. And so when I realized what it meant to me to actually make my own food and know everything that was going into the production or the creation of the food and knowing what was going into my body, I just, I realized how important that was. And I guess I just removed the, the feelings that I had previously held, uh, about the way I ate and just, it just became a, it became a fuel source for me. And I didn't want to attach any, uh, any judgments around it. And so I know food brings people together, but to me, it's just, it became a means to, you know, feeling it good as often as I possibly can. So, um, I guess my first question is, do you enjoy eating? I enjoy feeling good. And I know that's, I know that's, I know, I know that's not the same thing. I, 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 I would say, I don't think I get a, a, a strong dopamine hit from eating food. I mean, I enjoy, there are certain foods that are healthy that I enjoy eating. It, it tastes and feels good in my mouth, which I, it sounds weird to say, as I'm saying that, but 
I know how certain foods will affect the way I feel throughout the day. And so to, I guess, to answer your question, the way that you're looking for, no, I, I, I don't eat because I enjoy eating. I eat because I, I know that I want to feel good throughout the entire day and not crash in the afternoon. I, am I beating around the bush in that, in that question? <laughs> not exactly. I'm okay. just, um, I'm, I'm really curious about this because it doesn't sound to me the way that you described cooking for yourself, creating yeah. this fuel for yourself. It sounded like a creative endeavor in some ways. It didn't necessarily sound like you were thinking, oh, well, you know, I have to eat. So I'm just going to put together this bulgur wheat and green beans. Like <laughs> it, it sounds to me like you were experimenting, um, enjoying to some extent creating dishes that felt good to eat and you knew would feel good in your body. Am I misunderstanding this? No, you're not misunderstanding it. I will say, I mean, I don't enjoy the process of cooking. I don't like standing in the kitchen for 45 minutes to an hour. That That is something I don't enjoy. Now, I, I do enjoy my creation. I do enjoy eating it because I know that I, I put work into it and I know, you know, what is actually within the food itself. And it, it does taste good. So I, I guess, yes. And no, I, I don't enjoy the process. I'm not, I'm not a chef by any means. I can follow instructions, um, in my, uh, in my, uh, recipe app, but, uh, I, I do enjoy something that I eating something that I created. So yes, I, I guess you got me there. I, I do enjoy <laughs> that part of it. Oh, good. Whew. That's a relief because otherwise we'd have nothing in common. <laughs> right. Okay. Okay. That's fair. That's fair. I'm just kidding. <laughs> it is a really curious thing though, because, um, the first thing that popped into my head as you were saying that is that you were probably one of those kids who always had a stomach ache because <laughs> the food, the fuel he was putting into his body was not the correct fuel for his body. I would say yes, to an, a, a certain extent. I can remember one time in high school, I, and in high school, I, I definitely did not eat well. And I, I was the kid who would fall asleep in class. And I remember my French teacher waking me up one time and just asking about my diet. And I, I remember telling her I used to eat Pop-Tarts in the morning. And that is, and she, she mentioned the sugar aspect of it. And that is when I really started to think, you know, about sugar and about the, uh, the supplements I put into my body. And it, it's only grown from there. So yes, I, I definitely did not eat well, well into my twenties. And I, I started to really explore how I can optimize my own body, um, starting a, a handful of years ago. Mm -hmm. So you felt it early. Yes. Yes. And yes, I did. I would guess subconsciously, you knew that this was part of what was making you not feel so great physically, yes. emotionally, Yes. And the reason this popped into my head is because I know other people who went through similar circumstances, their parents later on would say, oh yeah, she was always complaining that her stomach was uncomfortable or her yeah. clothes were too tight around her waist or which indicates bloating to me right. Right. and discomfort based on what you're putting in your body. Yes, And you're not going to enjoy eating right. if you know that in 20 minutes or even in, you know, two days you're going to regret having eaten it. Yeah. And even if it's subconscious, I would say 90% of the time until you're in your twenties, it's subconscious. Yes. That you just don't like eating because you have the subconscious knowledge that later on you're going to be uncomfortable. Absolutely. And I think a lot of it, I started to have a little bit of foresight uh, around what I was eating and what subsequently what I was drinking as well. I, I, I knew I was going to have fun if I went out and had a handful of beers, but I, I also knew that I was the... Richard Branson said it best, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, alcohol bar, borrows happiness from tomorrow. And I, ever since I heard him say that, I think on Tim Ferriss's podcast, that that's just stuck with me. And I think when I first heard it a handful of years ago, that's when I experimented with slowing down my drinking and then ultimately decided to quit. Huh. That is really interesting. Yeah. So when, I, I'm sure there's a correlation here. When did you start your podcast, The Mosaic Life? <laughs> two years ago. Almost exactly two years ago. Yeah. <laughs> Uh. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're not the first one to draw that parallel. Um, yeah, <laughs> it, it, it was not intentional, um, to, to, for a little bit of additional context. I started it with a friend of mine, his name's Ernie Welsh. And, uh, he, he and I just always had conversations that challenged each other to do better. And eventually I talked him into 
doing a weekly podcast with me. And he thankfully took me through about 50 episodes before he went off and he wanted to, he's pursuing becoming a, a musician and he just released his first EP, which is fantastic. Wow. But um, yeah, it's, it's really exciting. And then uh, around episode 50, maybe 52, I decided to continue the podcast on my own and focus the theme of it. And so it really focused on happiness and, and well being. So, um, I'm assuming you've talked to people about nutrition in terms yes. of its co correlation with happiness and well-being. Absolutely. Um, there, and I am so far from an expert in health, health and nutrition. I just know what works for my body. There's a, a gentleman named Sean Wells. He's just, he's a, a, a literal genius when it comes to uh, the biomechanics and chemical makeup of brain chemistry and all of that. He's just a very, very smart man. And I was lucky enough to have him on the podcast. And uh, he released a book um, I, either this year, I think it was this year. And I, I'm not going to be able to remember the name of it, but uh, it's all about uh, what we can put in our body and how it makes us feel. And he's just, he's a really, really smart guy. I'll have to uh, include a link to that episode yeah, in the absolutely. show notes for this episode on my website. Perfect. And, I, and I'd love to also include a link from your friend Ernie and his new LP. Yes. So we can add a little uh, insight to our listeners' lives about the, the other people that we've been talking about so far. Perfect. Excellent. So now, like, I, I have all these thoughts <laughs> <laughs> running through my head because I am a food person. I love to cook. I love to entertain. I love bringing people to a place where they feel content, yes. comfort, nourished, and nurtured. So I, I know we're coming from different angles, but we're actually coming to the same place. We are. We are. And yeah. Um, I, I think when I really started to consider my relationship with food and not just, I mean, we all eat. We we do. I mean, that's just how we survive. And I, I've been I've been intermittent fasting for four or five years. So that basically means I don't I eat from about about noon to eight o'clock. So I have not had breakfast in a long long time. Um, but uh, on, aside from that, I really started thinking about like my actual feelings surrounding food. Uh, I think sometime last year, I read the book called Eating Animals, which was a very interesting book. It's by Jonathan Safran Foer. And I will preface this by saying I'm not a vegetarian. I, I, eat, I eat mostly vegetarian, but it's not because it's not due to animal cruelty. Obviously, that's a, that's a, a big part of what factory farming is. And it, it's, it's horrible. But I decided to cut back on my meat consumption because of what is put into those animals that are factory farm from mm -hmm. antibiotics to growth hormones to all that. And I just, I don't want that in my body. I, I think that's causing a lot of issues in our children, but again, I'm not a food scientist, but I started thinking about my relationship with food because he really delves into culture and food in that book. And I personally started thinking about Thanksgiving and how we all need <laughs> to eat turkey on Thanksgiving. And and that, I, I can't even remember the number. Billions of birds are, are killed every year in, in, because of, of our, maybe millions, uh, because of our holiday tradition. And I don't know, it, just, it, it suddenly didn't make sense to me that we, we put together these traditions and these, these feelings around food in the interest of coming together. And I, I understand the importance of having community, but I think we could do so without sitting around a table. I don't know. This is why I don't talk about it because it's hard for me to articulate <laughs> an unpopular opinion. And I know I, I'm very well aware this is an unpopular feeling that I have. So I, it's, it's something that I'm trying to hash out in my own mind. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe this conversation. Yes. Will help. Yes, please. <laughs> well, I think it's important to um, bring together this whole understanding of fuel for our bodies, because yeah. my sense is that um, if there wasn't um, food insecurity, right. that a lot of other problems would go away. Yeah. A lot of other problems would go away. And I don't talk about food insecurity in terms of not being enough McDonald's around. Right. Right. I mean, when we talk food insecurity, we're not talking about oh, well, we don't have enough Pop-Tarts in the world, right? <laughs> right exactly. Not enough people can, can walk to a McDonald's. That is right. not food insecurity. So I think the bigger issue for you to consider 
is the idea that um, when we do come to a table together to eat, it doesn't have to be that kind of food. Right. So for instance, I'll give you an example. Um, I just hosted 40 people, almost 40 people for a family reunion that I, uh, my husband and I catered at, at a park on grills. I mean, it was, it was absurd. That's amazing. <laughs> we had to bring our own knives and all our own gear. But anyway, it was, it turned out beautifully. Yeah, great. The, That's awesome. And the food was a central part of it, not because of, um, well, let me, let me back up a little. It was sure. a central part of it because when people come together to eat, it brings a sense of comfort. And if you have the food that's right, it can bring comfort and nourishment to our bodies. And perhaps what you're talking about is the kind of overeating, the ridiculous consumption of food at Thanksgiving that I have never played into. Yeah. We have four dishes on the table. We don't have eight dishes on the table. Right. We have, we share a meat, a, a veg, a, a start, <laughs> you know, that's, we, we don't have a table full of food, right. even though we have a table full of food. Um, and so I think maybe there's a little um, distinguishing here to do between eating for the sake of eating and eating for the sake of eating well. I guess. Yes. So for instance, our dinner consisted of chicken skewers with chicken that had been marinating, marinating in this amazing Korean spice that my friend made for me. Cause she knew I was doing all this stuff from scratch and she graciously gifted me a big batch of this marinade to put the chicken in. That's and awesome. we had vegetable, fresh vegetable skewers, mostly from organic farms. We had um, fresh roasted root veggies from organic farms here in Montana of uh, those golden beets, the red beets, garlic scapes, you know, the tops of garlic that they cut off to make the bulb grow yes. bigger um, and carrots and fingerling potatoes, all from local farms here in Montana and all roasted in olive oil and garlic salt. And then the sauces were fresh pesto with fresh basil and garlic and pumpkin seeds, roasted pumpkin seeds and pecans instead of pine nuts, because pine nuts are not usually sustainably collected. Yeah. Um, and then we had uh, a bar homemade barbecue sauce. That was the only thing with lots of sugar in it because it has ketchup. <laughs> it, ketchup right, made right. a ton of sugar. And then uh, a peanut satay sauce with coconut and peanut butter in it. Everything, everything was vegan except for the chicken yeah. and the caprese salad that I made with uh, mozzarella cheese. That's amazing. So the food, it was delicious. I mean, I'm not going to lie. It was delicious. Um, but I think what was more important is again, distinguishing between eating a ton of food for the sake of eating a ton of food and having the, the hangover you yeah. get as a result of it. Yeah. And the idea of eating together. So I made two huge challahs, the, the Jewish braided bread that we eat on the Sabbath, and we said a prayer over it. And there's this huge group, 38 people in a park in Park City, Utah, singing in Hebrew. <laughs> and that's resonating this prayer of gratitude up through the universe. I have a hard time thinking about that in any, any potentially negative context. That's great. Yes, I, I I I I love hearing that, and I I don't know. I if, if you can't if you couldn't tell, I'm a very type A all or nothing personality, and so I I, <laughs> I have a very I guess I have a very difficult time with moderation. I've had this conversation previously on my podcast as to whether or not moderation even exists. I don't think it does for me. I think for some people it may, uh, but for me, I just I, mm. it doesn't, and so there's perhaps a chance I'm willing to admit that I may at times bastardize certain ideas in the interest of going all or nothing with food or <laughs> sugar or alcohol or anything like that. And so that's why I don't generally share them because I know people don't generally hold those same opinions, but I don't know. It works for me. So, and I, I, I certainly would not, um, 
talk down on anybody uh, that that uh, like yourself. I mean, what the the experience you just described sounds phenomenal, and I mean, I, I, I highly respect you for for creating so much amazing food around such a, an incredible community. Thank you. Yeah, and and I'm not considering what you're saying to be negative. Really, I think we're actually coming to the same conclusion. It's just yeah. coming at it from different angles. Yes. And also the acknowledgement of, um, I think in that case, I, I would call it moderation because no one was filling their plates and right. filling their bellies until they were sick. Yes. Um, and that none of the food was the kind of food that was going to give them a hangover the next day. That's great. So there's that, but I hear you that there are some people that it's an all or nothing approach. And um, I think that we have to be conscious of that yeah. as community members and invite each other to hear these different perspectives. So I really appreciate that you're doing this. And as you create your message internally and externally around that, I think it is important to see that all or nothing approach and what that looks like for some people versus others. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I agree. And I, I do want to say, I, I don't know, as we're having this conversation, it's interesting timing. I'm reading a book called uh, the scientist and the spy. And I only bring that up because it's about, um, and I'm only about 50 pages in, it's about espionage in the agricultural industry and how uh, this is a true story, how in the, I guess, 2011, around that time, uh, there was a Chinese company that was coming or that was going to Iowa, I think it was, to actually steal um, uh, seed formulas or st steal corn seeds uh, from from fields. I, again, I'm not super far into the book, but I don't know, I, as we're just talking, it's just interesting to think about your area of the country where it seems like, to me, being in the Midwest, it seems like that's just, it makes sense that you have fresh food there. And I, that sounds silly because we have a lot of farms here in Ohio, but it's, you know, you think about fresh food, fresh corn, uh, all sorts of uh, fields of, of vegetables. I don't know. It's, it's, you, you having traveled yourself, I mean, do you, do you see like your part of the country having just so much more of the agricultural industry within it? Or is it just, is it that just my weird perception? Uh, it may be a weird perception for you because okay. Montana has a very short growing season. Okay. That's interesting. <laughs> there are, there are only a handful of, um, large, um, processing that you can do here in Montana meat, obviously beef and pork and lamb. We can do yeah. a lot of that here. We have a lot of ranches. As far as the other kinds of ag, we have corn and potatoes, um, probably very similar to what Columbus has, but we have a very short growing season, which is yeah, why true. I love going to the farmer's markets because yes. we have um, uh, some family farms that grow the, the tomatoes and the root veggies and uh, all, all of the green veggies, sugar, snap peas, snow peas, all those things that I can get just from there. There really isn't anything else you can get local outside of the summer season. Yeah. It's only summer that we can get these particular fruits and veggies. That's so, interesting. Okay. Good to know. Very limited, very limited. But um, I would love to know if, if your parents knew when you were little that you were kind of that extreme, that it was all or nothing with you. I don't, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I do know that I kind of gave up enjoying Halloween candy fairly early for a kid. Um, I, I was never, I never had a super, super sweet tooth when it came to Halloween. For example, I would of course eat my fair share the night of, but I, 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 I didn't overindulge in the, the days following. I don't know if I really, I don't know if I really had that all or nothing mentality back then. I'm just, I'm trying to think of, I, I played a lot of sports. I played golf. I played baseball. And I, while I was in little league, I mean, it was, it was very much, I was very passionate about it. And I, and I mean, it was all baseball all the time or, you know, all golf all the time when, when the season was, uh, when it was in season. And so I, I don't think they saw it back then. I think that's something that was kind of developed a, a little bit later in my life. That's interesting. I would encourage you to ask them if, you, I will. if they're still around that you can have that kind of conversation with them if you have that yeah. relationship. I'm, I'm very interested to know if, 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 if that started early or not. Well, and the reason I ask is that I know there are certain things about my personality that my mom knew before I did. 
Yeah. And uh, I look at my boys and I think I know things about them for when they're adults that they aren't necessarily demonstrating now as, as young adults, 20 and 22, but I can see in their thirties, these aspects of their personalities from their childhood making a comeback. <laughs> so, yeah. What, uh, what, what parts of your personality do you think stemmed from your childhood? Well, I'll give you an example. Um, when I was, I had just started singing with the rock band for the first time in my life. And I was 40, early forties. And I had been singing with them for a few years. My mom came to visit and we were making homemade beef jerky, <laughs> local meat <laughs> for her return trip. She had driven out from Sacramento and she was going to drive back. And I wanted to make sure she had a good protein rich snack for the road. Yes. So we were making this homemade jerky and we're standing at my kitchen. And she said, I, you know, if you had told me 10 years ago, I'd be standing here in your kitchen in Montana <laughs> making homemade beef jerky. Cause I, I was a city girl. I was DC all the way. Right. And um, she said, I just never would have believed it. And I laughed. I said, we put up pickles two months ago, <laughs> just like laughing. This is so out of character for where I thought my career, my life would go 10 years before. Yeah. And then I looked at my mom and I said, if you had told me I'd be singing in a rock band, in front of hundreds of people in go-go boots and mini dresses. I would never in a million years have believed you. And she laughed. And then she looked me straight in the eye and with a very serious expression said, I believe that. <laughs> so <laughs> there's that aspect. <laughs> yeah. And I'm actually really glad you brought that up because when you and I met, uh, it was obviously on a Zoom call uh, and a small networking event, you started talking about authenticity, uh, which was which struck me because I actually just am uh, releasing tomorrow my conversation with uh, Vicky's neighbor. She wrote a book on authenticity, and uh, so when I heard you say that, it, was, it caught my ear. And what I, I loved about that is you, you felt previously, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you if you would have said that you were a singer 10 or 15 years ago, that would have felt inauthentic to you. But now actually being a musician, it, I mean, it is part, part of your authenticity. And so I bring that up to say that I, I, I guess it's, it's tough for me to put labels on myself. And that's why I hate personality tests because I feel like I I'm putting myself into a box and I know personally that I am fully capable of changing if I, if it serves me well and what may be authentic today may not be authentic for me two years from now. And so I don't know, that's just, that's super interesting. And what you said, uh, you know, a matter of weeks ago has very much stuck with me. Thank you. I appreciate that. Absolutely. So tell me when you think about your um, authentic life, the mosaic podcast. Yes. Um, when you think about how many episodes do you have now? Episode 106 is coming out tomorrow. Oh, awesome. Well, That's, yeah. Congratulations. Thank you very much. That's a big deal. You hit that century mark and everything feels like, wow, I can't believe it. Although you're you're an all-in guy, so I guess you're I not am. surprised. I'm not an all-in girl, so I, I am surprised every time I'm consistently <laughs> releasing another episode. <laughs> But it feels good, when you think doesn't it? It does. It does. Yeah. It does. Um, doesn't feel authentic. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, when you think about all of those episodes and you think about things that have stuck with you, obviously our conversation stuck, which is awesome because yes. there's a lot more to come with that in our, in our future collaborations yeah. and, and relationship. What I'd love to hear is something else that really stuck with you. I have a handful of memories from my episodes that I continue to flip over and over in my head. They just keep coming back. What are a couple for you? That's an interesting question. Um, and it's actually something I, I have been reflecting on because I, I, I have always enjoyed writing. And I, I promise I'm getting to the point. I've always enjoyed writing. And I, I, I wrote a fiction book a number of years ago that I, it was for uh, National Novel Writing Month, and I never did anything with it, but I, I really, really enjoyed the process. And so I think from the start of this podcast, I've always wanted to write a book based on what I've learned. And I, I've started to consider that. Um, and then, so as I think back about what has, what I've kind of, uh, taken away from this podcast, I think themes really start to emerge, especially over the last 50 episodes. And I, if, 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 you, if you name one of my previous guests, I could probably pick out a few uh, points from memory about what we talked about. But 
some of the themes that just kind of tied together are especially in regard to happiness is that it's so holistic and so many aspects of our lives really play into that. It's not just about doing the things that we enjoy or, or getting pleasure from sex, drugs, or alcohol or other, you know, endorphin type of events. Um, but it's also about our health, our wellness, the amount of sleep we get, uh, the amount of time that we prioritize to, to specific activities that we really get value from in our lives. And I, um, I, I, I used to bullet journal. Are you familiar with bullet journaling? I am. One of my okay. best friends does it. That's great. That's awesome. And so I, I used to do it hardcore and I couldn't keep up with it. And so recently I, I did get a new journal and I wrote down, I've got a list of, I think seven or eight different categories in my life that I try to touch on every single day from sleep, obviously uh, to uh, leisure time, to learning time, to creation time. I try to fill in as many categories of those every day that I can. I, I very rarely get all the categories, but it allows me to prioritize the things in my life that I know bring great value to me. And so when it comes to the themes of the podcast and what I've learned over the last 50, again, specifically specific episodes, it's really how all encompassing or holistic every aspect of our life or how every aspect of our life really plays into our health and well-being. And so my goal has to become to feel good 100% of the time, which again, goes back to eating and not drinking and, and uh, all of those other healthy habits. And so I don't know, it's just, it's really just been uh, prioritizing the things in my life that I know bring value and deprioritizing, if that's a word, uh, the things that do not. So that would be like the the main theme and what you've you've taken away from all of these other episodes. Yes, and it's 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 I think so much of it has been just prioritizing the things in in my life that actually bring value. Um and so much of that comes down to gratitude and just recognizing who is able to add that value to your life because we don't live in a vacuum. And so much of what we do is influenced by the people around us. Uh, uh, Tim Ferriss likes to quote, I think it's Jim Rohn, uh, Rome or one of somebody I, have, I can send it to you after we are the average of the five people we spend the most time around. And that has really become kind of a, a mantra in my life. And so I want to make sure that the relationships that I'm willing to put time and, and energy into are ones that, actually bring value to my life instead of sucking value out of it. Mm, I'm in. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm good. with you all the way. <laughs> it's something that I talk to my clients about a lot. I love the way you started with happiness, but then the last part of everything you just said, you switched. You said, bring value yeah. instead of saying brings happiness, which I think as the book that I just sent to you yes. um, is talking about that, that how searching for happiness makes us unhappy. Yeah. But if we're searching for meaning, for, yeah. for value in our interactions and in our relationships, then that will spark happiness. But happiness isn't the goal. Agreed. Agreed. And I, I think I, it started as the goal for me because that's what everybody chases. And then when I was finally starting to understand that happiness isn't just one 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 notion, one accomplishment that we all of a sudden achieve, and that is actually broken down into different areas and different aspects. That's when I really started to have a firmer understanding of, of what it meant to me. You know, so many of us are on that hedonic treadmill. You know, we'll be happy when we have when we get a, a raise or we're able to buy a new car or house, and then you know, when we get those things, we just set our sights further down the line. I guess what I have trouble articulating, and but I, what it it means the most to me when I say that I started to realize that I was fully capable of being happy with everything that I have in my life right now. I could, I could sit here and I could, I could have a feeling of bliss of contentment because I knew that the things that I have in my life, I value. And so I guess it was with that realization that I stopped kicking the can down the line. And it was, it was very much an overnight thing for me, which so little of life is, mm -hmm. but when I realized that mm -hmm. it was, it was very much an aha moment. So who was one of the guests that helped you get that aha moment? And I know you said it was an overnight thing. I, I don't believe in that at all. Just so we're clear, just like you don't believe in moderation. Right. I, I don't believe in the overnight light bulb. What I do believe is that you were hearing things really, truly absorbing yeah. messages over the course of time. And you had a dimmer switch. And then that overnight was when it went full 
bright. And then you were suddenly aware and conscious of all of those little things combined. That's a very good way of putting it. I, I, I'm with you. I, I, I often talk about, I, I admonish overnight successes and the way that they're portrayed on social media. And so I, I fully agree with you. I don't think overnight anything exists. I, for me, it, just, it felt all of a sudden. And yeah, I knew it does. That's it a does. story. Yeah. It's your story. And I love it. And that's, I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. I'm suggesting that I would love to hear one of the stories that led you to that overnight moment. <laughs> yeah. And I knew you were going to ask me uh, uh, to name a guest specifically, and I, I'm, I'm going to have trouble doing so. You know, Because you met her, uh, Cynthia Garcia, she was actually the first guest uh, of 2021 on the podcast. And I really loved talking with her because she had such an, a, an amazing story. She had a very difficult childhood growing up, and now she's a celebrity celebrity nutritionist. She works with Khloe Kardashian, and she she does amazing things to help people transform their health and nutrition. And what I really got from her is that we have we are fully capable of transforming our stories. And we talk about childhood. We talk about how we're influenced growing up. That does not have to mean that's who we are as adults. We are capable of, I don't want to say rewriting our story because our our story is our past and we can't change that, but we're capable of having, of writing new chapters. We don't have to live in the shadow of who we used to be. And so if we're able to learn and grow from our past, then we're able to put ourselves on 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 the path that is going to be most beneficial for us, is going to serve us with the most value. Mm -hmm. And that we can actually come right back to the beginning, make this full circle. Well, it wasn't the beginning, but one of the comments about surrounding yourself with people who are doing what you want to be doing. Yes. The people who are being and not doing (laughs) necessarily. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. So I, I wasn't necessarily looking for a specific name, although I, I can't wait to get to know Cynthia better because I've, I'm going to reach out to her again as well, because um, we we had talked during that same event that you and I met. Um, and so I love that you mentioned her name. When I think about some of my guests, there was one in particular who said that um, she she was telling me a story about her youth and something that happened where she exerted some intense power as a three-year-old toward her father. Yeah. And the resulting conflict she ended up having for the rest of her life over, oh, I have power. And every time I've exerted it, I've pushed someone away from myself, someone I love. Right. And that was, that was what came out of our conversation. And it's not just the conversation that keeps coming back to me. It's this idea that as we uncovered the series of stories where we saw this pattern start to emerge, yeah. she wrote me the most beautiful email message after the episode aired about what that did for her, uncovering that story so that she could shift it. Yeah. And it's not like she's going to tell it as if it happened totally differently. Right. But when you tell your story from a completely shifted perspective, it's still the same story. Agreed. You're just observing it from a different angle. Yeah. Instead of being in it and being part of it, you're observing it from outside of it. And you're able to see the story with all the context that you couldn't see before. I imagine she was coming from a place of empowerment as opposed to, and I don't know her and I don't want to put this judgment on her, but from a, from a place of victimhood. I mean, there's that, that small distinction that allows you to really gain power from your past experiences, no matter how traumatic or painful. Absolutely. And she is an amazing human. I mean, this woman is somebody I have great, a great deal of respect for. So that's amazing. And that was two years ago. That's amazing. that, That interview is still sticky. So that's, that's what I was thinking is that I'm sure you have some that are just so sticky, even if yeah. your audiences didn't necessarily love it. Like I, I look through my, um, my analytics <laughs> on Chartable or whatever, yeah. Libsyn, I look at my analytics and I look at the episode that I thought were so sticky and had such big impact on me and my story. And they're like some of the lowest listenerships. It's the weirdest thing. And then, and then the ones that I thought, oh, that was so shallow. They have the most people that have listened to it. Yeah. <laughs> and that's fine. I mean, obviously we're not always our own audience. As a matter of fact, I would say probably the majority of the time we're not. You know, I, 
I don't want to disagree with you, but I want to challenge you on that because I think it's extremely important that at least when starting something and you don't know where it's going to go, that you need to, at least for me, I needed to create for myself because this is a story that I wanted to tell. And I wanted to, this is, this is a, a thread that I wanted to pull. And so I wanted to know exactly what happiness meant. Cause I know that everybody has their own feeling when, when you hear happiness, it's either I'm happy all the time, or I, I never have happiness. I don't deserve happiness. Everybody has their different a differing viewpoint or judgment based on that word. And so if I was going to create it, I didn't want to, I didn't want to create it in a way that was such, that had such broad appeal that it didn't have meaning to, well, to anybody, including myself. And so, I don't know, I, a lot of times when I hear, when I hear creators speak, they always say, create for yourself first, and then your audience will follow. And that's, I don't know, that's kind of the the, the path that I took creating this. And I'm not saying it's the right one, but it was just I feel like it was it was the right one for me because it allowed me to really find my voice. Um, I, and that's I know that's a very abstract way of putting it, but it, it allowed me to kind of carve a clear path for what I wanted to create. Now it has uh, it has a brand behind it uh, and whatever you know uh, sense of the word that we want to to give it. But it was just it was just very interesting because that's that's how I, I did start this podcast. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I would say that the only successful podcasts have to start with the desire to create it, not for the sake of an audience. Right. Absolutely. So I'm in agreement. Um, I would also say that there are times when I've recorded episodes that I didn't like. Yes. You no, know, that I just there. thought, yeah. well, um, but I had to publish them for yeah. one reason or another. And that's when I'm often surprised by other people liking them. And yeah. I think, okay, well, that that's the thing that I think we also have to be aware of as creators. And I'm a musician as well. And so yeah. I see this all the time that um, sometimes I'll sing a song and think that it's, you know, it's kind of easy for me. I don't really challenge myself, but it feels good and it feels, feels rich and soulful. Yeah. But I finish it and I'm like, oh, yeah. But then I do one that's hard, that has me exploring my range and yes. it's new to me and exciting. And I think I nail it. And all people can talk about was the easy one. <laughs> that, that one song you did, that was so lovely. It just touched me. And, and every time I obviously, I'm grateful, incredibly grateful when, when something that we create is, it touches an audience yeah. member. However, that works for them. I, yeah. It doesn't, I don't have any control over that. I wouldn't want to, um, but it is interesting to see which episodes are the ones that resonate with us and which ones end up just being not something that's so sticky for us, even if they're sticky for others. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. And I, I will tell you right out of the gate, I, I know so little about music. I, I, I would imagine that I'm the simple, uh, whatever the word is, a plebeian when it comes to enjoying music. I mean, I, I like, I like catchy music. I like music that, that makes my, my foot tap. And so mm -hmm. I have to imagine, I, I, I've heard stories that of musicians, you know, they, they've got their singles and they hate playing them because they're just, they are, they are mass produced for, you know, for the radio. So I, I get why something that was easy for you, one, is most enjoyable by by listeners because they don't appreciate the art that went in to a harder creation for you, um, and and just I I don't know I I understand I just I can understand why that doesn't bring a ton of value to you but also brings a ton of joy to to the average listener. Hmm. Yeah, I never thought of it that way, but I, I appreciate hearing it that way. It's a different perspective. Yeah, so thank absolutely. You. Yeah. So when you think about your five people. And yes. I think it's far more than that, um, only because we are so influenced, yeah. especially now more than ever before, because we have so much coming at us at any given time. I think it's far more than five. But when I think of the people that I choose to spend time with, I think about people who, my, what I said in um, an event one time was, when I say, oh my gosh, I have this crazy idea. And the person's response is, awesome, how can I help? Those yes. are the people I choose. So what would be your, your test? That's my test. What's your test? That's a great question. Um, 
I don't know. I, I kind of want to steal your answer. I've never thought about that before. Um, <laughs> if I have a crazy idea, I guess it's, I mean, similarly, you know, how can, how can I support you? You know what? I don't know. I, I guess, let, let me, let me backtrack a little bit. I, I guess I got to the point in creating things that it, when I do start to create something, I, I hold it close to my chest because one, I, I think it's in, I guess it's in spite of who I used to be. I, I know that when I had ideas in the past, I would brag about that idea and I would never put the work in. So if I had a great idea for a book, I'd go on Facebook and say, I'm going to write this amazing book about, you know, this, this astronaut who goes to Venus and, you know, captures an alien, that whatever. And I would just, <laughs> I would, I would put a premise, a paragraph or two together on Facebook. And then I'm like, eh, I don't want to write it. And so now in spite of the person that I used to be, if I'm going to do something, I want to actually put work into it before I talk about it. And so I don't, I, 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 I don't know. I, I don't have an answer for you. And I, I think that's why I'm just, you're making, you're really making me challenge who I used to be and in, in my thought processes that have the, how they've evolved over time. So I don't, I, I, I don't know how to answer that question. So how about this? Let's, let's work through it. We have okay. a couple more minutes. Yeah. Before we wrap up, when you think about presenting your thought idea, like I don't, I don't necessarily just go out and do ideas like your your previous your former self. I, I don't really do that because I have a problem with accountability. <laughs> if I do that, then I feel like I have to be accountable, and I don't like that. I don't yeah. like obligation. <laughs> I have a thing about that. Um, but when you think about when you do present it to somebody. I know I want somebody who's going to question it in, in a supportive way. That's going to make it better. Yeah. As opposed to the person who questions it and says, um, no, that's not going to work or that's not really you. Yeah. So I'd love to be around other people that I can support in that way as well. The people who tell me their, their ideas, even if they haven't completely thought them through let let me say this i i absolutely appreciate and respect what you said and so when i when i have something that i'm willing to show somebody i don't like to ask people what do you like about this because i want to grow i mean, i i like to say what do you hate about this and I, I know that's very that's very harsh but i want to know what is it that i can do to improve and i want to take that criticism so i can help something grow if i mean I have to, you know, do so with a thick skin because if somebody just says this sucks, then, you know, I, what am I going to do with that? I can't do anything with that. Tell me why. Exactly. And exactly. so, yes, I, I, I want people to challenge me on an idea and I want people to show me the flaws so I can work through them early. And so I can help make whatever product it is or creative pursuit. I can make it that much better. Awesome. That's a perfect answer. See, there you go. You did have I, an answer. You see, just you, didn't know it yet. That's true. You challenged me. I like this. Let's. I, I want to keep talking. I want to see how much you can help improve my life because you're doing a very good job already. <laughs> for better or for worse. Yeah. One of my friends said, I never would have done that if it wasn't for you. And I thought, I don't know if that's a compliment. <laughs> it's a compliment. It is a compliment. Absolutely. <laughs> well, this has been such a thoughtful conversation, Trey. I, I so appreciate your willingness to go to this depth and to think hard about your answers because a lot of people, they have this script yeah. in their heads. And the fact that you are so adaptable in how your mind works, I think is a, just such a huge testament to your hosting skills. Uh, Cause I've listened to a, a handful of those episodes already. Um, and I can hear all of what you're saying in the way that you interview your guests as well. So really thoughtful. I thank appreciate you. that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Seriously. And so I want to follow up with that. What do you hate about it? What can I do better? <laughs> you <laughs> well, can tell me offline if you want. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll do that offline. Okay, no, okay. I thought it was wonderful, but I, I do have one last question. If yeah. you could um, send listeners to things beside the great, the great resources you've already shared with us, like um, looking for value and not happiness, Ernie's music, Sean Wells, um, the scientist and the spy. What other resources would you want our listeners to use and how can they reach out to you and 
just so that our listeners know, I will have all this in the show notes. So you don't have to rush over and start jotting things down or hit pause. This is probably a conversation within itself. So I will just give you the name Ryan Holiday and uh, Ego is the Enemy is a wonderful book that absolutely changed my life. And, you know, one question that I do ask my podcast of my guests is what their life changing book was. And that that book just helped me get a grasp on what my ego was and how how I can work with it as opposed to work against it. And so through Ryan Holiday, uh, through reading his other books, I've discovered stoicism, which I'm not going to get into, but it's it's for me, it's become an operating system for my life. It is the realization that the only thing I control can control in this life is how I respond to circumstances and pouting and, and being upset about something that's outside of my control is just a waste of my time. So if anybody's interested in, in rethinking their mindsets, I would, I would highly encourage you to check out Stoicism, check out Ryan Holiday. If you want to connect with me, you can find me on Instagram at Trey Kaufman, T-R-E-Y-K-A-U-F-F-M-A-N. And then the podcast is the mosaic life podcast.com. That's awesome. And I'm guessing that um, Ego is the Enemy, that author also read Viktor Frankl. I would be willing to bet. I would absolutely imagine. So I'm, I'm almost positive I, I've seen him quote Viktor Frankl before. So I'm sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, yeah. Love Viktor Frankl. Yeah. Trey, thank you so much. This has been an absolute pleasure. Absolutely. I'm so thankful for the opportunity. Thank you for hosting this. I, I appreciate you. Thank you again. Are you ready to start your story portfolio so you have the right story ready to share when the opportunity presents itself? When you're ready to get started, my book, Your Stories Don't Define You, How You Tell Them Will, is available in all the regular places, and the audiobook version is available on Google Play and on my website, elkinsconsulting.com. As a special bonus for listeners, the audiobook includes two songs recorded by my band, Spare Change in my living room in Montana. Also on my website is a free podcast interview checklist. It's available to download to make sure you make the most out of your next podcast interview. If you enjoyed this podcast, please feel free to rate the podcast and leave a review and let me know that you've done it so I can thank you properly. Thank you. Thank you.